it's a lot to cover. So anyway, let's get on to the next slide. So just have to go through the disclaimer. You know how this works. Basically, everything we're discussing here is for educational purposes only. It's not investment advice. Uh, we're not giving you any recommendations for investments, anything like that. There's a risk of loss with trading. And uh, myself, head of the charts, and also anyone affiliated with this company is not responsible for your trading and investment returns. So <clears throat> here we go. And about myself, Jesse Colombo, I'm an economic analyst who warned about the global financial crisis as a university student. So this is when I was 18 years old. I started warning about the U.S. housing and credit bubble. And I built a website called stockmarketcrash.net. And I started warning about the explosive growth in housing prices as well as debt, debt, you know, mortgages, consumer credit, credit cards, and so on. This website became very popular and it was in the LA Times back in 2005 because it was one of the most highly trafficked housing bubble related websites. And then when the financial crisis hit, then I became recognized by the London Times for predicting the crisis. So basically I took off from that point once I noticed that there were new bubbles developing around the world. And I started warning about that in 2011, all these new bubbles that started developing as a result of the Fed and other central banks policies to try to reinflate the global financial markets. They're basically creating another bubble here. And popular social media personality where I have over 100,000 followers on Twitter, Facebook, and all the main social networks out there. You can just Google my name, you can uh, find me on there. And then since 2013, I've been a Forbes columnist writing on Forbes.com and writing about bubbles. I haven't written in a while just because I've been so busy, but I'm going to start that up again. And also just an economic, anti, sorry, anti-economic bubble and free market activist. So I, that's what I do. I'm trying to prevent the inflation of these bubbles because I just, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, I want to stop the risk that these bubbles pose to the world. And I'm going to show you what that risk is. And I think uh, you're going to be pretty scared when you see that. So anyway, the basic premise here is that the global recovery is a sham. Just to start out, I know it's pretty blunt, but you'll see what I'm saying. So, of course, yeah, you see economic numbers improving around the world in the United States, UK, China. Every, you know, Everything looks like it's going up. You have the financial markets are going up. Jobs are being created. Stock prices are going up. Definitely a lot better than it was during the dark days of 2009 during the uh, financial crisis. But unfortunately... The so-called recovery is driven by an explosion of debt and also inflated asset prices. What I mean by that is inflated housing prices, bond prices, stock prices, you name it, it's probably soaring right now. So I've developed a term for this. It's called bubble recovery or bubble-driven economic recovery. And that's actually a well-known term. You can Google that. It's in the uh, Financial Times lexicon and it's in uh, Investopedia and so on. I'm trying to make it more popular. So turns out the 2008 crisis itself was caused by a bubble recovery because the recovery from the 2001 recession, actually, you know, let me backtrack for those of you who may not be familiar with financial market history. If you recall back in the late 90s, there was a big boom in dot-com stocks and also the entire tech sector. So when that bubble popped around 2000, 2001, it created a recession in 2001. And in response, the Fed cut rates and did what, what it could to try to stimulate the global, not global economy, even though that ended up happening, but stimulate the U.S. economy. And of course, they did create a recovery. And that recovery lasted until about 2007. The problem is that recovery was an artificial recovery because it was driven by soaring housing and housing prices, as well as rising consumer debt, as I said, mortgages and so on. So most economists at that time thought that the recovery was legit. They thought it was a, the real deal. You know, you have jobs being created, you have the markets are going up and everything like that. But of course they created the bubble that led to the 2008 crisis. So I believe we're in a similar situation like that right now where, yeah, you have this recovery, but just like it was from 2001 to 2007, it was just, it's driven by debt. It's driven by these really overvalued speculative markets, as I'll show you. So this may seem like common sense, but it's really common sense is not so common. 
debt binges create temporary economic booms. So when you have governments, you have corporations, you have consumers taking on massive amounts of debt, they do create explosive but temporary economic booms. So these booms always end in disaster because they borrowed growth from the future. And here's a quote from a uh, well-known fund manager, Lacey Hunt. It's called, it's a, it goes, debt is future consumption denied. So it's it's kind of like if you're a child, let's say your parent gives you a bag of candy, you can either spread that out over a week, over two days, or you can eat it all within one hour. It's the same thing. So we're taking on so much debt right now, we're creating this big growth party. The problem is at some point, it's gonna have to be paid back. So that leads to an economic bust when the, when the debt bubble collapses. So turns out total global outstanding debt has grown by over $60 trillion since 2007. So just, it's a mind boggling figure. It's hard to even comprehend that amount of debt. And yet that's what's driving our recovery from the 2008, 2009 crisis. So you have in ultra low interest rate environments like what we have right now, those environments are conducive to these debt and asset bubbles. And I'm gonna show you exactly what I mean in a, in a graphical manner in the next few slides. So, Right, right here you can see this chart. This is a chart of LIBOR interest rates, and this is a good proxy for interest rates around the world. And you can see this goes back about 30 years. And so as I said, every time interest rates drop to a new low, it usually creates an economic boom because it's so much cheaper for governments and consumers and corporations to borrow. But the problem is when rates go back up, everything goes bust. And we've seen this pattern over and over and over and over. It has to do with manipulating the borrowing costs. So you can see right over here, what I've circled is since the global financial crisis, this is, we're talking over seven years now, interest rates have been at a record low for a record length of time. So we've never seen anything like this in human history. And I, I really do mean that when I say human history going all the way back, and I'm gonna show you in a few charts why that's the case. So we have this very unusual situation where we've never had rates this low. And not only that, they've never been this low for this long. So it's a real double whammy. And you can see over here, this is the same chart, but I've superimposed this, uh, these circles where I showed every time there's a period of low interest rates, it creates some sort of an economic boom, but then when rates go back up, that boom turns into a bust. So you can see this is going back to the mid 80s we had relatively low interest rates. You can actually, I don't know if you can see my cursor over here, but you can see interest rates were relatively low at that time. And sure enough, there was a bubble developing in Japan, which they're actually still suffering from, by the way. There was a bubble that formed in US housing. US housing prices actually shot up back in the late eighties. And it led to, it, sh it should say SNL crisis, uh, savings and loan crisis. But anyway, when interest rate rates started to go back up in the late 80s, Japan experienced its own bust, and then the U.S. housing market experienced its own bust, and then actually caused several, many banks, actually a lot of regional banks to go under, and it was called the SNL or savings and loans crisis. And then in response, the Fed cut rates and other central banks around the world cut rates in order to try to stave off that or try to help the economy recover from that recession that, that we had in the early 90s. And you can see at that time, rates went to a new low. And it was there around 1992, 93, 94. And it led to another bubble in Asia. This time it was called the Asian Economic Miracle. And also you had a lot of emerging markets like Mexico and, Th and Thailand, all these different countries around the world, emerging economies started to really boom at that time. But a lot of that had to do with those record low interest rates for that time. And then of course, when rates went back up, they experienced a really bad bust. And actually it was around 1997, 1998 that, that things really got bad in emerging markets. And you had the, the Asian currency crisis around that time. And then of course, Fed cut rates a little bit at that time, which then led to the dot-com bubble. So you had exploding stock prices for pets.com and all these really whimsical type of, uh, all different types of tech companies, mostly online type of companies, because of course that was just really when the internet started to take hold. 
and you had this big economic boom and also stock boom. And then, of course, Fed raised rates in the late 90s, and it, we experienced a huge bust. At that time, that was one of the biggest busts that we ever had, and it created a recession by the early 2000s. So in response, what happened? The Fed cut rates again. And yeah, they created another recovery, but that recovery was driven by U.S. and European housing. So from around 2001 to 2007, you had housing prices in the U.S. start to skyrocket. Same thing in Europe, all across the board. So again, it created a recovery, but it was just it was based on it was based on sand instead of concrete. It wasn't a solid foundation behind that recovery. And then finally, you can see over here into the financial crisis, they cut rates all the way to a new low that they've never they've rates have never been this low. And now you have these bubbles that are developing around the world in U.S. stocks, bonds, property, tech startups, uh, also a lot of different countries, a lot of countries that never experienced a bubble before or didn't experience a crisis back in 08. Now they're starting to experience a bubble. So this, in this case, it's Australia, Canada, a lot of emerging market countries, you know, countries like Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Latin America. I mean, it's, it's so widespread. It's just mind boggling, as, as you'll see from the coming charts. Also global bonds, huge bubble, and that leads into the next slide. So we're in a truly unprecedented situation right now where global interest rates are at 5,000 year lows. <laughs> you know, think 5,000 years, I mean, that is just so far back in human history. That goes, I'm not even sure when the oldest civilization started. I, I know it was thousands of years ago, but Turns out this this chart uh, came from Bank of America Merrill Lynch, and they actually pieced together using history books and other historic sources to try to estimate what interest rates were throughout history. And then they compared them to today's rates, and you can see we're actually at the lowest they've ever been. So I don't know what it was like back in the days of Cro-Magnon or, <laughs> or the Neanderthals, but at least for 5,000 years, you know, we're, this is the lowest it's been. So... Of course, this is going to lead to some severe consequences when you have borrowing costs at such a low level. So anyway, so as I was saying, when you have record low interest rates, it encourages borrowing binges from corporations, from individuals, households, governments, it really everyone across the board starts to borrow when, when you can borrow that cheaply. And it also makes real estate a much more attractive investment because you can, instead of getting a mortgage at 6%, you get a mortgage at 3% and so on, depending on the country. So, of course, you have so many people going in and buying houses. And also because when you have interest rates this low, you can't, you can't get much interest. Like, let's say if you have $100,000 and you want to put it in the bank, rates are so low that you're not going to get much out of it. You're not going to get much in terms of interest. So people try to look for higher yielding investments and usually the property market is a beneficiary of that. So I'm going to show you these charts really quickly because I have so many, but this just shows you globally housing prices are just exploding. You can see Austria over here. Past 10 years, prices have doubled. And you'll see that same pattern across the board. Belgium, Finland, Germany, Germany started to soar uh, around 2010. That's because that's when the European Central Bank tried to cut rates to record lows in order to fight the, uh, the European debt crisis that was really hitting hard at that time. And sure enough, Germany is seen as a safe haven. So people are now speculating on real estate in Germany because of those record low rates. Same thing in Norway, same thing in Sweden, Iceland. UK, you can see UK had a big surge back in the late 90s, early 2000s. It corrected a bit in 2008, and now it's back to its old highs. And it's actually even higher than it was back then, especially if you look at London. This is the total UK property market. But if you look at London, it's much higher than it was even at its peak back in 2008, 2000, uh, sorry, 2007, 2008. So it's, you can see this is a truly global phenomenon. Canada as well. A lot of people think Canada is a safe haven. Maybe it was at one point, but you have these housing prices soaring just like 
just like what happened in the U.S. 10, 12, 13 years ago. And they're taking on massive amounts of debt in order to fund these, these real estate purchases. And again, record low interest rates, that's really the common denominator behind all these housing bubbles. Australia is another one. New Zealand. China. Hong Kong. I mean, look, at, look at Hong Kong's chart. I mean, does that look sustainable? Prices have tripled in really since 2009. So we're talking in 10 years. Imagine housing prices triple in your country or, or your, your town. Well, that's what happened in Hong Kong. <laughs> That's just not sustainable. People say, oh, well, housing prices go up over the long run because of inflation. Well, I buy, I can buy that to some extent, but not when you have housing prices triple in seven years. There's something more that's at work here aside from just long run inflation. Philippines, same thing. Indonesia, same thing. Singapore as well. And a lot of these countries I actually warned about in the last three years where I, on my Forbes column, I went out and I published big reports that went, that went viral where I warned about bubbles in these countries and it created a flurry of news headlines and, and you had all these central bankers and political leaders and, and business leaders really come out against me personally, calling me out, saying I'm wrong. Singapore was one of those countries, but you can see, sure enough, Prices are now starting to go back down. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot more downside. And uh, I'll try to answer all the questions toward the end after Rich speaks, after I'm done, and then I'll try to go through and answer. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I just It's hard for me to do while I'm in the middle of the presentation. Malaysia is another one. Look at this. this you can see these charts are going parabolic. So that's really, really not the hallmark of a sustainable real estate market when you have something going almost vertical like that. And in this case, it's another one of those scenarios where it's, it's, it's really prices have doubled in the past decade or so. Taiwan, same thing. South Korea, I mean, it's, you can see it's so prolific. It's really, it's everywhere. You know, it's not like we're saying, oh, this is focused in the UK or it's just focused on China. It's really, truly global. Like humanity has never seen something on this scale before. This is uh, United Arab Emirates. Same thing. Israel. I mean, look at Israel. Does that look sustainable to you? You know, this is since 2009. I think housing prices are, are up over 50%. They're almost, I think, 70-something percent, if I can read that properly. South Africa, same thing. Brazil. I don't want to bore you with the details. I'll, I'm almost done with these. Don't worry. Colombia. I mean, just all the way up to the sky. Mexico. Peru. I mean, just taking off like a rocket. Uruguay, it's really the who's who of countries here that are experiencing these housing bubbles, again, triggered by these 5,000-year low interest rates. And then we, we really go back to the U.S. over here. You can see housing prices are actually back up near their old highs. And those prices that we had back then were not sustainable to begin with relative to incomes. And here we are. We're back at the old highs. And that's because the Fed really tried to pump so much liquidity into the economy. They tried to reinflate a lot of those old bubbles that popped back in 2008. And that's why we have a recovery. You know, it's not like things are really recover. It's not like, it's not like the underlying imbalances have been fixed. Really, they just went back to the old medicine, which is just, oh, let's just reinflate the bubble. So I discussed a little bit of global bubble situation. Now I just want to talk a little bit about investments and how this affects your investments and, and really how it affects my views on what I hold and what I don't hold and, and how to go forward with this. So you can see I've been warning about the U.S. stock bubble for several years and throughout that entire time I wasn't saying that it was going to pop immediately. I was warning against the process of what I saw as far as what was driving that bull market. And I actually, back in uh, early 2012, I, I wrote a pretty popular article on my, on my blog, thebubblebubble.com, basically <clears throat> describing and basically warning that this was going to happen where you have this massive inflation in the U.S. stock market because of how much money is being pumped in and because of these record low interest rates. And, and sure enough, that's exactly what played out. 
So you can see prices, U.S. stock prices, in this case, this is the S&P 500, they tripled since early 2009, which was the low that we had back in the uh, financial crisis. But unfortunately, instead of being a sustainable bull market, you know, not all bull markets are bubbles. Some bull markets are completely justified by economic growth and earnings growth. Unfortunately, this one is another dangerous bubble or another dangerous bull market, unsustainable one, because it's overvalued. So what we're looking at over here is one of the many valuation indicators or ratios that economists and financial analysts look at to determine whether the overall market's overvalued or undervalued, fairly valued, and so on, and tells you whether it's worth holding, whether it's worth buying, and so on. So you can see over here, and let me just explain what this is. This is called the Schiller P-E ratio. It's the, <clears throat> the price of the S&P 500 divided by the average of 10 years of inflation adjusted earnings. So I, I don't want to overcomplicate things, but basically it shows you what's what's the average price of stocks rel relative to their earnings. So if the price is high compared to their earnings, it's overvalued. You're paying a lot for that earnings stream. If the price is low, it means you're getting a lot of good value. It means that you're paying very little for those earnings. So you can see over here, I have these horizontal lines at 20 and right around 13. Those are the levels that are typically used to determine whether stock markets overvalued or undervalued. So you can see every time this ratio is above 20, it's basically, I, I, I circled it so it's red. And that tells you that the market's overvalued. And usually, historically, it's led to bear markets or, or at least long periods of stagnation in the market. And you can see the first one over here was 1900. And that was the first time, at least, at least in modern history, where prices became so overvalued. And sure enough, there was a, if I can recall correctly, there was, there was a, a pretty powerful bear market and then period of stagnation right around that time. And then, you know, you, you'll typically see this ratio go back and forth, up and down. It'll go from being overvalued to undervalued. So after being overvalued, usually a bear market will happen. The market will go down <clears throat> and then eventually becomes undervalued again. That's that's when you want to buy because it's it's cheap. The market's cheap. So in 1920, early 1920s, after experiencing a bust for about two decades, you can see the market became cheap again. And that was the time to buy. And sure enough, a huge bull market happened throughout the 1920s. And that was known as the Roaring Twenties bull market. But unfortunately, after about 10 years of that bull market, and you had so much, you have so many speculators gambling with debt or margin debt, the market became extremely overvalued again. And that's what we saw back in the late 20s. And then sure enough, the stock market crash of 1929 and ultimately the Great Depression occurred. And that was signaled by the fact that the market was so overvalued. And then sure enough, in the early 30s, after that big bear market, it was time to buy again. You can see the market was undervalued. You can see this ratio was under seven. That was a time to buy. And sure enough, we had a, a pretty powerful bull market after that. And you'll see this pattern over and over and over and over. Same thing, late 1960s, there was the nifty 50 boom. Everyone was all excited about stocks. You know, this was occurring after about two decades of powerful growth with the post-war economic boom and eventually it just became so overvalued and it really just played itself out and then that signaled that there was going to be two decades of stagnate, uh, stagnation in the market and that's exactly what happened really if you adjusted for, uh, for inflation there was a really powerful bear market even though the stock market pretty much treaded water it just stayed flat because of the amount of inflation that they saw back in the 1970s, it actually caused the market to lose value in inflation-adjusted terms. So finally, after about two decades of that, in the early 80s, the market was undervalued again. It was the time to buy. This was the, one of the most important buying times ever in, the mar in pretty much in market history. And I'm really jealous of, of baby boomers or even older people who were able to take advantage of that. I wasn't even born, unfortunately, at that point. But that was pretty much the best time to buy. And sure enough, you had this powerful bull market that lasted all the way until, well, actually, it's still going, but it, 
the bull market valuations went all the way into until uh, 2000. So you had two decades of just straight up for the most part. And then, of course, you can see the dot com, uh, dot com bubble over here, which I'm you can see my cursor. That's when the market became extremely overvalued, more than it ever became, and that signaled that the market was really ripe for a correction. And and really, that's what happened. And then, so in the 2008 crash, we never got to that point where the market was so under undervalued, where it was time to buy. The market went down a little bit, but the Fed stepped in. And started inflating the market again. So it never, central banks never let stocks truly correct and reach fair value levels or let alone undervalued levels. And it turns out we're still in that overvalued territory. You can see where I circled this most recent circle. It shows that we're extremely overvalued right now. It's not quite as bad as it was during the dot com bubble, but it's as bad as it was in the late 60s. And as bad as it was back in 1937, which led to a subsequent, you know, powerful bear market as well. So because of this reason, because of this reason alone, I don't want to own stocks as an investor at this point. For me, I think there are better investments out there. I don't want to be owning a market that has very little upside and a lot of downside. So of course, the market's been like this for a good 20 years. It's been overvalued, but for me, I'm just choosing to keep my powder dry when it comes to investing in stocks. I don't own stocks right now by choice because my goal is I want to start buying after the next bear market. I want to buy when it's green again. That's the only time I want to buy. All right, so you can see. So that was one indicator. Again, that was the Schiller P.E. ratio. But it's not just that indicator that shows how overvalued we are right now. It's other indicators as well, including... Warren Buffett's most favorite indicator, which is the corporate equities to GDP ratio. Basically, you take the total value of all stocks trading in the United States and you divide it by our GDP or our gross domestic product. And again, this is Warren Buffett's favorite indicator for determining whether the market's overvalued or undervalued or fairly valued. And you can see it's, it really shows the same thing that it showed, even though they're not in the same scale on the x-axis. but you can see this was the late 1960s, and you can see the market became uh, fairly, fairly overvalued, somewhat overvalued, not wildly overvalued like it was back in 2000, but definitely enough to, to really make you take caution if you were if you were watching. And sure enough, that's the same signal that you see back over here. And then again, early 80s was the best time to buy, and market was really undervalued. That's the same circle that you see on this other indicator in the prior slide. So here we are right now. We're more overvalued than we were back in 2007, 2008 before the crash. We're not quite as bad as we were in the year 2000, but we're still quite bad. And, and for me, it's another reason why I don't want to be owning stocks, at, at least just in terms of being a long-term buy and hold investor. Why would I want to own something that has so much downside and so little upside? So again, Back to some of the first slides that we were discussing. I was saying how debt is driving this stock bubble. And here's where I'm going to show you that proof. There's two different forms of debt primarily that are driving the stock bubble. Uh, one form is known as margin debt. You know, you've probably heard stories of people taking on margin loans. It's where they borrow from their broker to buy stocks. And usually in bull markets, they're going to take on margin and go long on stocks because the market's going up. And, they think they can't lose. Well, turns out that's exactly what happened in 2000. You can see right over here, uh, first circle. And then we have the second circle, which is back in 2007, led to the 2008 plunge. And here we are. We've never, we've never had this much margin debt in history. So this has actually exceeded the prior peaks. So you can see that margin debt is the red line and the blue line is the S&P 500. You can see they move in lockstep. So again, it's another reason why I feel like stocks really don't have that much more upside from here because you've already have so many traders have already binged on debt. How much more can they take on? And again, I'm not saying to short tomorrow. I'm not saying it's going to crash tomorrow. We may have a little upside from here, but for me, from a risk versus reward standpoint, I have no interest in owning stocks 
until we get another correction and I can buy after the bust. All right, here's another example of how debt is driving the stock bubble. So because we've had these record low interest rates like I discussed at the beginning of this presentation, I said that corporations are able to borrow very cheaply, in this case from the bond market, because rates are so low. So for them, they say, hey, I can borrow at 2%, in this case from the bond market, because rates are so low. So for them, they say, hey, I can borrow at 2%, I can borrow at 3%, and let's do it. So that turns out that's what they've been doing. They've been taking on debt in the form of, you know, really, from the bond market, and they've been buying back their own stock. And you can see this really, there's no precedent for this before 2003, 2004. But then starting in the mid-2000s, you can see the surge of debt. And then, of course, it led to another plunge. So anyway, as I said, uh, companies were borrowing from the bond market and they're buying back their own stock. And that's what's inflating the stock market. They're inflating their own stock. They're taking on debt to buy their own stock, basically. It's, it's, it sounds very complicated and convoluted, but this welcome to the world we live in, right? So you can see since about 2010, we've had the same pattern where you have this big borrowing binge, and you can see the change in debt is this red line over here. And you can see net buybacks, that's companies buying back their own stock, in the blue line over here. So in the last five, six years, we've had over $2 trillion worth of buybacks. And of course, that's inflating the market. It's, that's an, another example how record low interest rates lead to bubbles in the stock market. It's, it's, not driven by, it's not driven by sustainable organic demand. It's not like, you know, of course, the stock market's tripled in the past seven years, but the economy itself didn't triple. It's really driven by debt. It's not sustainable. Again, another reason why I don't want to own the stock market here is a long-term buy-and-hold investor. So how will this all end? A lot of people still think it's going to keep going up, but I really think they're extremely naive. So here's a quote by Lud Ludwig von Mises, who's one of my favorite economists. He's an Austrian economist, a uh, school of economic thought that basically warns against debt expansion, that's the type of economic school that I adhere to as well. So anyway, here's the quote. There is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as the result of voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. So it sounds very complicated. It sounds very a uh, little bit of old fashioned language, but I'm just gonna explain that in simple terms. What he's saying here is that when you have an economic boom or a bubble recovery, it's driven by governments, corporations, and individuals taking on debt, it's going to end in, in crisis no matter what. The only choice is what flavor of crisis it's going to end in. Will it be a crisis where central banks say, enough is enough, we can't keep expanding debt this much, and then they raise interest rates and then create their own bust and try to prevent it from expanding even further or if they if they let's say they're completely ignorant of the risks of exploding debt they just let it keep going they'll hold interest rates pretty much at zero percent forever and just see where it goes Ult ultimately that leads to a currency crisis instead of a bust it'll actually lead to the complete destruction of the currency and that's one of my big fears is that that's really where we're heading right now where central banks around the world are so desperate to really prop up the economy and keep this bull market going, you know, you can see the difficulty just raising interest rates, uh, you know, a quarter of a percent. <laughs> Imagine trying to raise it back two, three, four, five percent. So at this point, it seems like they're going the currency crisis route rather than, you know, taking the punch bowl away from the party early. So on to how to profit from this. This I've been thinking for so many years about how to profit from this. It's really not that obvious because, for, at least in my case, I don't want to own mainstream investments. I don't want to own bonds at a time when interest rates are at 5,000-year lows. Why? Because it means bond prices are at 5,000-year highs. Why do I want to buy a market that's so high, that has got so, lim so, uh, so limited upside, and yet 
has so much potential downside. So for me, I don't want to own bonds. I don't want to own property because I showed you all those property charts. You can see around the world, this big property mania right now. So for me, I think a lot of the winnings have been had in property. And I showed you that stocks are overvalued too. And I showed you the US stock market, but it's the same thing for many other markets around the world, stock markets around the world. So I'm not interested in those mainstream investments. You have to really get creative and start looking for these alternative investments. So it's really very simple. I know these, these investments may seem like cliches, but they're actually a lot more powerful, I think, than, than most people believe they really are, especially with what I envision ahead with as far as currency crises and so on. So I believe in hard assets, <clears throat> which are assets that can't be printed. You know, you have so many central banks trying to print money and they're trying to prop up the economy. Well, you can't print gold, you can't print silver, you can't print Bitcoin, you can't print new farmland. So for me, I want to own those investments because I believe that there's going to be an acceleration of the printing. Because eventually, this debt, is just, we're going to reach debt saturation. And central banks are going to get so desperate, they're just going to keep printing because they have nothing else to do. There's nothing else they can really do to keep propping up the economy. And then that's when, that's when currencies, are really, currencies are really going to devalue. So gold, silver, Bitcoin, again, those are investments that you can't print. There's just a fixed supply of them. And I believe they're going to go up in value relative to these fiat or paper currencies. <clears throat> But also, I believe they're going to gain not, not just inflation-adjusted terms, but uh, terms. But they're going to actually, eventually, you're going to have so many people jumping into them as speculators as well. So you're going to gain in real terms as well. Meaning, it's not you're not going to win just because currencies are plunging. You're going to win because this is the new safe haven that everyone wants to be in. <clears throat> I also like farm uh, productive farmland. You know, barriers to entry are a little higher in that. You know, compared to buying a few thousand dollars worth of gold and silver, but for those who have the means, I, I really do like the idea of that because Earth's population is soaring and they're not making any more farmland, so I think that's a wise buy. I also like having some cash. I believe in being liquid. You know, you need some cash for emergencies. You got to pay the bills, or let's say you lose your job, or something of that nature. It's good to have some of that liquid cash on the sidelines and also I believe in having some stored food and necessities as well where in case there's an emergency in case there's you know strife insurrection so on that typically accompanies a market collapse I believe in having some of that again you know <laughs> some people might think it's a little eccentric but for me I'd rather be prepared I'd rather also have some necessities too like some you know basic first aid type of items uh, water filter so that you can filter your water. Again, it's probably not probably not going to need that tomorrow, but I'd rather have it than than not have it. Because if you see what happens in certain countries like Venezuela, you, you know you have Eastern Europe throughout you know a long time, pretty much the 20th century. Many countries around the world have experienced crises. You know we haven't experienced that in the U.S. in a long time, but never say never. I'd rather be hedged for all scenarios. And again, keep it simple. These, these, as I said, these are cliches. I know a lot of people think about, you know, the typical survivalist in a bunker, but I really do believe, believe there is some truth to this, especially when you see how much debt there is around the world. That these hard assets are going to gain in value relative to these currencies that are constantly being printed. So, this is my this is my slide about longer term investments. You know, investments that you can pretty much buy and hold and forget and not have to worry about the timing of it or trading it and so on. But also wanted to talk about another type of strategy that I'm really excited about. I really started getting into this in the last two years or so. And a lot of this had to do with my excitement about this occurred because I, I actually linked up with Rich Lepis, who's the CEO of Head of the Charts. And we worked together for a long time. And he really turned me on to intraday trading or trading in a very short term. So he's primarily a stock trader, and what he's doing is, he, instead of holding longer term, he's trying to make money in 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. So let me just go through these bullet points, and I'll explain a little more about that and, and 
how he goes about that. Also, how I'm, I plan to use intraday stock trading to profit from the coming collapse. So in the final stages of the bubble's inflation, I, I would not be surprised if the stock market soared dramatically from here. You know, you, you have a final last hurrah. Typically, when you have a bubble, at the very end of a bubble, the markets will soar. They'll go almost vertical. And, and that could still be ahead. See, you may not want to be in a position where you're betting on it going down or so on. Just bet on volatility. Because we know volatility is pretty much inevitable. So we could experience a, a, another wave of inflation from here when central banks get really desperate. But when this finally collapses, as we know it will, you're going to have a, a, just a huge surge of volatility where you just have so many different sectors, so many different stocks that were overvalued are now coming back down to earth. And you can profit from that by shorting the market as it goes down. But also there's violent surges, like let's say in a bear market, you'll have a lot of violent surges all the way down, like up, you know, upside momentum before another plunge. So because of this kind of volatility that happens when bubbles pop, I'm not a fan of longer term trading. You're trading where you're holding over a few weeks or a few months because there's just too much risk that happens overnight. So there's just too much risk where let's say you're long a stock or you own a stock and you think it's going to go up because there's short term momentum. But the problem is, and we see this now, all you need is another central bank around the world to come up with some announcement where you have something like the Brexit scenario, which is really took everyone by surprise. And then overnight the stock plunges. So for me, there's just too much 24 hour risk right now in the stock market. And that's why I've really pulled away from that longer term trading and really, I guess, came over to this, to the side that, that really uh, rich was into as far as that short term trading, because they don't hold overnight positions at the end of the day, he goes home and he can sleep at night because his money's in cash, at least in his trading account. He doesn't have to worry about, Oh, is bank of Japan going to come out with some sudden announcement or, uh, you know, Bank of England's going to come out with some announcement. It's nice to not have to worry about that. So that short-term intraday stock trading allows you to control your risk better while you're capturing what I call micro moves. You can, it's just so much better for your peace of mind. So just going to discuss and show you some examples of like the kind of uh, trading that Rich and everyone else in the trading room, including including myself, I'm I'm getting up to speed. I'm still learning, of course, uh, you know, from the masters. But just to show you how this works, what they do is they trade volatile small cap stocks, small companies like biotech companies, uh, any company that has a lot of news or or a sudden catalyst that causes it to surge or plunge that day is is fair game as long as it has enough liquidity. Uh, as long as it has enough volume in it, they'll trade it. And what really essentially what they're looking to do, it's quite simple. They're looking to make small moves here and there, but they multiply it throughout the day. So this is, this is one example of one of the stocks, EBIO. They've treat, they trade this all the time. And they, I know they trade this, I think, I believe in the past week, but it's really a, a constant stock that they're trading. And you can see it surged 25 cents. And it may not seem like a lot, oh, 25 cents, who cares about that? But the typical trading size that they're using, at really at a minimum, is 1,000 shares. So if you can make a 25 cent move, you can make profit on 25 on 1,000 shares, you make 25 cents, that's $250. And again, that may not seem like a lot of money in and of itself, but you multiply that by four in one day, now, now you made $1,000 in one day. I'm gonna show you how that really adds up. But what they do, uh, is the, they're looking for these setups. These setups all have common patterns. They all look very similar to each other, and they're looking to jump on these moves. And it's not just to the upside, it's also to the downside. They make money when the market goes down, they make money when stocks go up. That's that's what I like about it, is you can make money when the market goes down. So over here, you can see this is another example. Um, INSY is another stock that they trade quite a bit. And in this case, th this stock plunged. This was, I, I believe this was yesterday. And this stock moved down $1.50 per share. And again, you, you say, oh, that doesn't really sound like a lot of money. But when you're trading on 1,000 shares, that's $1,500 in just 
two hours worth of work. And again, they multiply this throughout the day. They're looking for these common setups all day long where they can jump on it and profit. So this is where the volatility comes in and, and volatility that will be caused by the bursting bubbles is that it causes a lot of news. When you have a, a bursting bubble, it creates bear markets that are so powerful where the stock will drop $10, $15 in one day. On 1,000 shares, if you can make a $10 move, that's ten grand. And, I, and it may sound preposterous, but I've seen Rich do it. I've seen Brett, who's another instructor in the room. I've seen them do it firsthand, and they do it and multiply it throughout the day. Another example, Hog. This is Harley Davidson. They trade this quite a bit. And you can see within about two or three hours, right before lunch, it dropped $2 per share. On 1,000 shares, we're talking $2,000 for a few hours of work. And again, the trading day is not over. They're going to look for other, other opportunities and so on. And the traders who are quite successful, I know Rich, I know Brett, they're not trading with 1,000 shares. They're trading with, I don't even want to tell you how many shares, because when they start compounding these profits, they're able to buy more shares. So instead of trading with 1,000 shares, they're trading with 10,000 and so on. So on 10,000 shares, you make $2 per share, that's $20,000. So that's how they're able to keep growing their accounts over and over and over and over and over. And it really high volatile, high volatility environments are ideal for this kind of trading. So for me, I view this as a form of hedging myself against these coming times that I can just get in there and start profiting from upside and downside volatility. Whereas let's say if you're in another type of business, most businesses or most jobs out there are economically sensitive. So if the economy goes down, the business goes down with it. But this is one of the rare businesses where you can actually make money when things are going to hell. And you can make money when things are going up. So it's it, it's really nice. Like, let's say we have another bull market. Let's say the bull market extends another two more years and goes to new highs. You won't be missing out on that upside because you can still profit as an intraday trader as the market's going up. So for me... This is why I'm so excited about this. And then I want to tie in actually intraday trading into those other investments that I discussed. My idea as far as how to prepare for the crisis is to use this type of intraday trading that Rich teaches to build up capital and then start buying up those investments that I said, like you know gold, Bitcoin, silver, farmland. So you're really getting the best of both worlds. You're covered for the long term and you're covered for the short term. All right, so again, I'll just show you some examples. You can see over here, and we were discussing how if you can make, you know, X amount of cents per day, how much it, how much that equals. So if you can make 30 cents per share on average each day, which is, is not hard to do, like for someone like Rich, someone like Brett, Donna, all the people, the moderators in the room, this is this is a cakewalk for them. But if you can do that every day on average on a thousand shares, you're talking three hundred dollars a day or seventy five thousand dollars in profit per year. But if you can make fifty cents, and again, it, you don't have to make it in five minutes, you can do it throughout the entire trading day. You can you can you can do two twenty five cent moves, which which is not hard to do at all, and I made fifty cents for the day on a thousand shares, we're talking five hundred dollars a day or 125,000 per year. Now we're starting to talk, you know, that's solid upper middle class income. <laughs> it was a while before I started to make around that money. <laughs> anyway, so if you can make a dollar a day times 1,000 shares, we're talking $1,000 a day or 250,000 a year. Now we're talking living quite well. And again, if you're making that kind of money, you're not gonna be trading with 1,000 shares. You're probably gonna be stepping up your the sh your average trade size, maybe you trade 5,000 shares and so on. So you can make 10,000 a day. And again, it sounds preposterous. And I actually thought it was preposterous until, until I actually saw and sat alongside Rich as he did this. And I said, wow, I want to do this myself. This is exactly what I was looking for. I was looking for something like this for years. And I found it and, it's, you know, still continue to, to work at it. And, this is the most exciting way of hedging against the crisis that I've found so far. So again, I don't want to go into all the details of 
specific system that they're using, but I want to just allude to it and show you really what they're doing. I said that they're trying to find these these quick moves that make 25 cents or a dollar per share in you know maybe a half an hour or so. The way they're doing it is they're following the smart money. They're following big informed traders like market makers. They're following hedge funds. They're following informed traders that know where the market's going to go. They control this stock. And they've been able to spot the common signs that when these big boys start to move, you can see the same patterns over and over. So one of the ways that they do this is using time and sales. You can see I have two examples of time and sales windows here. Time and sales just shows you a real time log of all the transactions that occurred in the stock and you'll see it scrolling throughout the day. And what they've trained themselves to do, this is known as tape reading by the way, what they've trained themselves to do is look at the patterns in this time and sales or, the, or it's known as the tape and use that to determine if the smart money is buying or selling and they they look at key levels key psychological levels in the chart you know major round numbers major whole numbers numbers like twenty dollars per share which has psychological significance what they do is they want to see what the smart money is doing at that point is the smart money bullish at that level is the smart money selling or shorting at that level and then they use that to determine if, if they want to get into the trade or not and it, this is something that not many people really know about is, is this type of tape reading. Like you really can't find books on tape reading. I've tried to find so many books. There's really, it's just unbelievable how few people know about this. A lot of people know about technical analysis. They know about chart patterns and it, there's some validity to that. Don't get me wrong, but I believe in going right to the source. You want to follow the smart money. We want to see what the, what the big boys are doing and, and really piggyback on them. So I'm, I don't want to tell you all the technical side of that. I'm going to actually going to have Rich come on shortly within a few minutes, and he's going to be able to explain in, in his own words. And let's say if I didn't explain something that you wanted to know, he'll be able to answer that question as well. But I wanted to let you know, I wanted to let you know we have a special promotion where you can come into this trading room and see exactly how we're trading throughout the day. So I'm actually going to give you the link right now. One second. Actually, I'm sorry. Can, can uh, Donna or someone post that link in the room so someone can click on it, please? Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll post it right there in a second. So anyway, we want to invite you to a one week in the trading room. We have a, tr uh, a trial where you can come in and see exactly how these traders are trading throughout the day. You know, people like Donna, people like Rich, people like like Pratish. I mean, really phenomenal traders. I've seen them firsthand. You'll get a chance to try it out, see how they trade for only $20. So if you use the coupon code bubble, literally bubble, <laughs> I'm going to write that in, you'll get it for $20. And you can choose when you want to start the trial, but you can come in and you can ask them questions and you can see what they're doing, how they're approaching these stocks, how they're looking for these setups where they can make $0.25, cents, $0.50, cents, a dollar, and so on. And there's really no substitute for seeing it with your own eyes. You know, I can, I can, I can do five hours of, of webinars and it's not going to give you a full idea of of what it's really like when you're in the room and, and watching these traders do it and you'll see that they're actually calling out these moves before they happen it's it's not like they're saying in hindsight oh yeah I knew that was gonna go up you know any, anyone can do that they're calling it ahead of time so don't take our word for it just come in try it out uh, I also want to say too that I'm not getting paid for this webinar. I don't, I'm actually not being remunerated financially. I'm only doing this actually because I'm receiving training from Rich and, and the other instructors. Uh, I'm not getting any money out of this. I really do believe in this enough where I wanted to take the course myself and I wanted to go through all the advanced training. And in order to compensate them, I said, you know what, let me, let me invite my followers to come on in and s see what it's about. So that's that's my uh, that's my take on it. So, Rich, if you're there, if you want to come on in, you want to discuss your take on it. Yeah, quick sound check. Can everyone hear me loud and clear? Can everyone hear me loud and clear? 
Hold on one second. I can hear myself twice. Okay. So, well, I just want to thank Jesse. I mean, that was absolutely phenomenal. Always has such amazing content. I know a lot of you, I mean, every time I speak with that guy, I mean, I, I end up learning something. Um, just to, you know, to show you guys that it goes back both ways. I mean, yes, I'm, you know, I'm teaching Jesse. This is my, my specialty is tape reading and is day trading. Um, but just going back both ways, Jesse has taught me I've been collecting gold pretty much ever since Jesse and I became friends based off of the information that he that he taught me. I mean, to the same extent that instead of giving savings bonds to, um, for instance, my niece, instead of giving her savings bond, I actually buy her physical gold to hold on to as an investment in and, you know, in, for the long term. So, you know, everything kind of works, you know, goes back and forth both ways. But um, like I said, my my biggest forte and um, ahead of the charts trading's forte is this day trading, because like Jesse was saying, I mean the one thing you got to think about is just I just saw somebody type in there that you know financial, uh, you had people bankers and stuff calling their you know their their spouses and their family and telling them to take money out of the banks. I never want to be in a position like that. Now one thing about swing trading, I know a lot of you guys you do some you know futures you do. do everyone, if you could just give me a quick chat back real quick. What what kind of trader is everyone in here? Do we have any day traders? Are we futures traders, swing traders, investors? What is everyone trading in here? Okay, so we have a lot of day traders out there so far. Cryptocurrency. Well, Tim, you're probably a lot higher than my pay grade with that one position traders okay well one of the first things that I was ever taught when we were talking about swing trading and kind of holding overnight and he told me a little little story you know to cut this a little bit quick because I want to put Jesse back on so he can do some question and answer for you guys but he said if you were at work okay and you went out and you took fifty thousand dollars and you left it on your desk and then went home for the day okay do you think it would be there the next day when you got back what do you guys think <laughs> I sure don't. Okay, and that's kind of what you know what I was kind of bred into when I was first learning how to trade this way. So does everyone does anyone know who Jesse Livermore is? Because this is one of the biggest names. This is probably the only person that you'll ever find out there in the any any type of book that you'll actually find out there about tape reading. So what I do is I actually look at the orders that are being executed from market makers out there, and I see based off specific levels and what they're buying, what they're selling, and what their reaction to. Because at the end of the day, I could put any order out there in the world that I want to. Reminiscence of a stock operator. There you go. I mean, that book to this day is still is still relevant. Okay, but I can put any order in the world that I want. Anyone ever cancel an order before? Okay, the stock, something just happened within that order. You didn't like it anymore, so you hit cancel. Okay, so yeah, orders tell us a lot, but that's not going to tell us everything. When I execute an order, it's going to show up in this time in sales, and that is what better to follow than what the market maker is actually doing. Okay, to me, that is the most important part of of trading, because at the end of the day, none of us are ever going to be smarter than Goldman Sachs. I, you know, we could all have in best wish. It's just not. It's not going to happen. Okay, not myself. Not the best traders I've ever met. But what I can do is I can actually go over and I can look at what Goldman Sachs is doing. And by doing that, that helps us, like I said, ahead of the charts. Really what that means is just knowing where the direction of a stock is going to be going before it actually happens. All right, guys. So um, one thing like Jesse wanted, I wanted to invite you guys into my trade room um, where you guys are going to be able to spend an entire week and actually see what we do here. Now, what I want to do is I just want to give you guys a quick uh, – I'm just going to take the screen for one second, Jesse, and then you'll take it back right after. One second, monitor five. Here we go. Okay, what I want to do is I want to just invite you guys in. Now, usually we charge – it's a five-day trading trial, so it's five of the, of the actual days of the uh, – uh, five trading days, excuse me. So it's a week long, but it's five actual trading days. And all you have to do is all you're going to do, oops, I got to get rid of that. Um, you're going to go to that link and you just fill it out. Okay. But when you come, when you uh, go to put it in there, you're going to want to go to the coupon code. And what that's going to do right here, and you're going to put in bubble, it's going to put it for 20 bucks. I'm not looking to make money on this. Believe me. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not going to keep the company going off of, off of $20. Okay, but what it's going to do, it's gonna, just going to be able to give you guys a, a look into what we do every day. As, as Jesse was showing, I mean, to make a dollar a day, which isn't that much, because a lot of the stocks we look at, they, they, they down or up huge percentages. 
Okay, that, that's a lot. You're talking about two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and a lot of the times that dollar that you're going to be making, you're done before eleven o'clock. Okay, now on top of that, one of the the bigger things that I do now, this is a trade room. Don't get me wrong, trading is the is our first and primary goal. Okay, but what is also at the same time is an education room because at the end of the day, if things are slow and we're not trading and there's really nothing to trade out there because we all know volatility dies down sometimes. What we do is people ask questions, and I have no problem with that whatsoever. Okay, so what I do is every uh, every Tuesday, 12:30 Eastern time, I have something what's called Traders Exchange, and what I allow my my chat room participants to do is they can ask me any question they can possibly think of, and I'll we sit there for an hour and just do question and answer, whether it be from a trade that morning, a trade last week. They can have screenshots. Sometimes I'll show the actual emails, and really just go over any aspect of trading the way that you know my methodology that they'd like to go over okay which is a huge huge part of of you know our education here at ahead of the charts all right guys so i don't want to take up too much more of your time okay uh, once again it was a pleasure thank you everybody for coming thank you so much jesse jesse and i have been friends you know for some time now and um just thank you so much for coming on and providing this great content for us i'm going to give the uh the mic back to you. And once again, everyone, thank you so much. My pleasure, Rich. Thank you so much. So he always explains it very well. It's nice to hear different uh, different viewpoints. You know, we're talking about the same thing, but we're talking about it from different angles. <laughs> but obviously our goal here is the same thing. We want to profit from that volatility. So, all right, I want to open up the, the room. You can ask me some questions about the bubbles, anything I discussed in today's presentation. You know, I, I don't have too, too long to do it. I'll put my email address out there if you want to ask me any further questions, but I'll, I'll take, you know, let's say 10, 15 minutes of questions and uh, take it from there. So let's talk bubbles. Let's talk, talk debt. If this, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. You know, everything I discussed here was very complex today. So if there's anything you want me to explain, I'm sure, I'm sure I could explain in a lot more detail. All right. Lots of questions. My outlook. Oh yeah, Nilesh asked me my outlook on oil and commodity currencies like like Canadian dollar in the event of a crisis or QE4. Okay, that's a good. That's actually a good question. Well, typically, I would say there's a difference between the pre-2008 era and the post-2008 era, and how the dollar act, U.S. dollar acts, and how the Canadian dollar acts. Before 2008. Typically, when there was when there was some sort of crisis, or let's say there was a real global liquidity crisis like we had in 2008, sometimes you'd actually have the U.S. dollar soar. That's what happened in 2008. U.S. dollar was one of the most uh, one of the best performing assets out there because people wanted to get into a liquid currency. They wanted to get out of growth sensitive currencies like can uh, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar. So, but since 2008, the Fed basically reacts to every type of market panic by threatening to print more money or promising to print more money and that causes the US dollar to devalue so, so things are getting so complicated these days that I don't even actually like to forecast in the intermediate term anymore for me I think that's just a way of getting egg on your face because I you really to be honest I couldn't even tell you because I may have one type of forecast based on on one framework, and then all of a sudden you have something like Brexit, which comes out of left field, and it changes everything. That's another reason why I've really shifted almost exclusively to intraday trading because it's it's really the only way you can avoid that overnight risk. So let's put it this way: oil probably wouldn't do well in in, in another crisis because oil goes up and down with the economy. When the economy is doing well, factories are humming, people are going on vacation, they're driving, you need more oil. In an economic slump like we saw in early 2009, oil prices typically drop because there's just less demand. So I don't like oil as a, uh, as a crisis hedge in the case of a recession. All right, let me see other questions. All right, JL, that's actually a good question. Let me, let me show you what I'm looking at in oil right now. One second. I'm just pulling up a chart right now. Computer's a little slow. A lot of programs running, but okay, here we go. 
just to show you really quickly, I have a finviz.com. I use the site quite often. It's just nice and quick. See, here's my concern with oil right now. If you see these lines at the bottom of the chart, you'll see green, you'll see blue, you'll see red. Green is the smart money. So, one second, I'm just getting a message really quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to, I have to share the screen. I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Bear with me one moment. All right, here we go. So you can see over here, everything underneath this chart, you can see this green line, that shows you the smart money. And when it's really low, it means that the smart money is shorting. So I wanna do what the smart money is doing. Whereas when they're high, it means that they have a, a smaller short, pos short position, they're more bullish on it. So you can see I zoom out, turns out, the big oil bust that started back two years ago, June 2014, was predicted by the fact that the smart money in green was the most short that they'd been in years. And then, of course, this rebound was predicted by the fact that the smart money was relative, relatively bullish. So just to go into the short term again, I want to show you that as oil has been rallying again over the past five, six months, you can see the smart money has been shorting again. That's not what you want to see if you're bullish on oil. That's not really a good sign. So I'm concerned that there could be another correction if oil could break below that $45 support level. And again, let's say if oil were to break to the upside, then I would not want to be shorting. Like let's say if oil breaks and can close above 50, then I would say, okay, there's a good chance of, of further bullish action if that were to happen. So for me, I'm willing to change my view very quickly depending on if key support or resistance levels are broken. But it is concerning that you have the smart money still have a 300,000 uh, contracts worth of, of short positions and they haven't covered those short positions. And if this was truly a bottom, you would think that they would cover that. And again, I, this is subject to change. If we if we see bullish technical action, for me, the trend is your friend. I, I will always respect the trend first and foremost. I won't fight the trend, even though I may say I question it. It doesn't mean I have to love it, but I'll still, I'm still not going to want to fight the trend. And again, a lot of this stuff is very, very complex. If you want to have further discussion about this, email me, jesse at, at uh, jesse at thebubblebubble.com, and I'm going to continue to answer questions. Don't worry, but don't feel like you have to, you know, all clamor right at once. Let me go through. Oh, okay, that's actually a good question, Stan. Stan's asking, any specific trading account you recommend for, for tape reading and trading? Uh, speaking for myself and, and a lot of the people in the head of the charts trading room, we use TradeStation. Uh, not that you have to use TradeStation. It just happens to be that they that they're most really the most advanced broker for intraday stock trading. They have really the best features. They have the most readable time and sales windows. They have something called the matrix, which uh, shows you real time supply and demand in the market for that stock. You know, you can trade with interactive brokers. You can use, uh, you know, Scott trade. There's a lot of different companies out there you could use, but for me, I, I personally prefer TradeStation. You know, why not just stick with the best? I, again, I'm not making money from TradeStation to, to, re to recommend it. So either way, but you know, check them out. I'm sure, I think they have some trials as well. You can try out and see which one you like the best before really making the jump. All right, let me go through. Oh, Tim asked me, what do you think what do you think will be the effect of helicopter money like basic income on commodities? Any favorable ones? Well, that, helicopter money is basically where central banks are just printing money, you know, all over the place and buying up assets and so on. It's it goes back to those same hard hard assets that I discussed earlier. I like Bitcoin, I like silver, I like farmland. The reason why I like those the best is because those are not economically sensitive, meaning you know, an asset like copper, for example, goes up and down with the economy. So copper is used in, in electrical wiring and piping when, when, uh, when houses are built. Houses are built typically in good times. In bad times, demand for copper falls. So I don't want to own something that's going to go up and down with the economy. Whereas something like gold and silver, typically 
it's not it's not so sensitive to economic uh, ups and downs and swings. So that's why I prefer those. I'm sure I'll write some articles on this in the future where I go into a little more detail. And again, we only really had an hour or so here, so it's hard to you know cover so many different. This is really such a complex topic. I didn't even know how I could possibly squeeze this into one hour. I'm I'm actually happy it didn't go much longer than it did. All right, let me let me go through the other questions. Uh, David is asking, how do you calculate the odds of negative interest rates hitting the USA in the next two to three years? What do you think the impact of cash hoarding will be, and how do people who hold annuities, how will insurance companies be negatively impacted? Well. I believe it's really negative interest rates are just going to be inevitable. When you have this much debt out there, governments and central banks are going to want to reduce the cost of that debt as much as possible. They want to refinance it at even lower rates. You can see Europe already has negative interest rates. You have something like $12 trillion worth of global bonds are now trading essentially at negative interest rates. I believe it's just a matter of time. I can't tell you the precise probability in the next two, three years. All I can just... My focus right now is not so much about forecasting the longer term, again, because I've seen things like where the Brexit comes and it throws out all the forecasts that you may have had. So I'm no longer focusing as much on that. And that's, again, why I like intraday trading, because it's not about long term predictions. It's about profiting in the very short term. All you have to do is forecast the next five minutes. It's much easier to forecast the next five minutes than the next five days, let alone two months there's just too many catalysts out there right now things some things are just not predictable and that's something i've i've come to learn in time is that some things are just not predictable and i think there are more of those now than there than ever before where you have you know we can go home tonight and all of a sudden Japan, bank of japan just comes out with a completely new announcement that they're going to try to weaken the yen and now all of a sudden you, you have all the reverberation around the world some things just you, you don't know. It's the same thing. Can can an economist predict who's going to win the U.S. presidential election? No way, because you don't know if if Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton is going to say something wonky in two months from now that causes the, them to plunge in the polls. It's really for me. I want to avoid prediction as much as possible. Here's one thing. I only predict bubbles only because it's the only thing that I can predict with 100% certainty that when you have an explosion of debt and you have over, overvalued assets that it's going to correct. I don't predict direction when it comes to, you know, what's crude oil going to do in two months from now? For me, I just react. I just watch key levels. I see volume. I want to see how it acts at those levels. But I, I can't tell you what it's going to be one year from now. And really, neither can anyone else. And if they do, they're lying. <laughs> All right, let me go through the other questions. All right, let me go. A lot of questions. I love these questions. I just feel bad. I can't answer them all, but again, I'll answer them. Uh, if you email me, I will do my best to get back to you. All right, let me see. Uh, Joe was asking, he said, it seems almost everyone is bearish nowadays and thinks we're in a bubble. In what ways can we be wrong? I, I would argue that most people don't think we're in a bubble or are bearish. I, I believe most people are cautiously optimistic they even though they they admit that the economy's growing very slowly and that it's not a very powerful recovery but very few people now uh, if you look at a broad spectrum of people very few people seem to believe that we're heading for a truly global bust the way i do so and of course we may this bull market may not be over we could see maybe another year two years i, I don't want to predict again but we could see more upside. When you have central banks and you have governments so desperate to try to prop up and inflate the economy, I don't want to bet against them. But again, with intraday trading, you don't have to worry about what's happening in the longer term. You don't have to worry about Fed policy. That's part of the reason why I like intraday trading, because it, it frees you up from having to think about those concerns. You can just focus on mastering these setups. At this point, for me, I... For me, I just want to build up capital so I can survive nicely and you know, along with the people I love in the coming crisis. You know, it used to be that I was this real zealot where I wanted to, you know, prevent all the bubbles, and I still want to prevent bubbles. But at this point, I realize the 
you're fighting the central banks. They're going to do what they're, they're going to want to do. And in the meantime, I need to protect myself and people I care about. And the way to do that is by, if I can become very successful from this volatility, then that's what I want to do. And then we can take it from there. You know, let's say you build up a lot of capital from intraday trading and then you buy gold and it gets revalued. Well, I, I hope to be in that situation. And what I want to do is I want to buy undervalued stocks in the coming bear market. I want to buy stocks when they're under, you know, if you remember those green circles and red circles, I want to buy when it's green. I want to have a lot of capital to do that with at that time. And, and that's why I'm so, uh, why I'm so enthusi enthusiastic about this type of short-term trading. All right, let me see. Alan was asking me, what do you think about gold miners? Well, actually, the people in the head of, uh, head of the charts trade a lot of gold mining stocks. They're, they're really volatile and they make great moves. When it comes to an investment, I know a lot of people for years have been saying they're so cheap, they're so cheap. The problem is they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. They've been underperforming gold over the longer term. I don't know. I have to look and see what they've been doing lately. But as far as just an undervalued buy and hold investment, I could see why they'd have a place in a portfolio. You know, I, I, I let's say if you have a large amount of capital and you want to diversify, I, I don't think having a small position in it could be that bad, but I wouldn't put all my money in it because they're so volatile. A lot of those gold miners have been running at a loss. It's, they're very speculative. But sure, if you want to buy the the higher quality, more established companies, you know, I think you could do worse. I'd rather own gold mining stocks than Amazon.com with its uh, you know extremely overvalued high PE ratio. I'd rather own that than many of the tech stocks. Uh, Nilesh was asking me, what's my outlook on the housing bubble in Canada? Well. Canadian housing bubble, I'm going to go back to that chart. It just cannot end well. Really, just my, my view is the same for Canada as it is for Australia. You have this, where is it? I think it's the beginning. Canadian housing prices are up very dramatically, even more so in places like Vancouver, Toronto, the big cities. For me, I think it's a no-brainer. It's Really, I, I don't want to own something. I certainly wouldn't want to buy into the market right up here at the top. And when it bursts, yeah, I believe that's going to hurt the Canadian dollar because Canada's central bank is going to have to lower interest rates and eventually maybe even do a QE of their own, quantitative easing, which means printing Canadian dollars, which devalues the currency. But again, it's, it's very difficult to predict exactly where the Canadian dollar is going to go because you got to realize if Canadian if, – if, the Canadian dollar and Canada's economy is going down at the same time. Chances are the U.S. is going to be going down at the same time as well. It's usually they go up and down together. So in that exam, in that scenario, you'd have the Fed printing money like crazy, which would weaken the dollar relative to the Canadian dollar. So you're going to have this kind of back and forth. The only the only constant I believe is that fiat or paper currencies are going to keep bring, being printed, and that's. That means that they're going to devalue relative to hard assets like gold, silver, farmland, uh, Bitcoin as well. And again, Bitcoin. People may question why do I why do I like Bitcoin as an as an investment? Let me let me go to that slide. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a digital currency. It's a virtual currency. Uh, I don't. It, it's it, difficult for me to explain all the. The technical complexities of it but essentially bitcoin it's just an online version of cash and what i like about it is that you no central bank controls it no central bank like the fed or, or european central bank can print bitcoin there's a relatively fixed amount of bitcoin out there i know it does grow each year at a small rate but i like it as a diversifier i would not put all my money in bitcoin trust me but to have maybe five percent of a portfolio in Bitcoin, I don't think it's that crazy at all. I think it's just another alternative, and I, the more ways of diversifying, the better, in my opinion. So that's my view on Bitcoin. Uh, Ian, what about Bitgold? That that's a good question. I have to look into Bitgold a little more. I believe it's Bitcoin. It's tied to gold. I like the idea of it. I just have to research all the technicalities of it and see what the risks are. But it it, it sounds it sounds like it has uh, potential, but again, I don't really have 
all the detail about that specific product and what the downsides are. I, in theory, I like the idea of a Bitcoin that's backed by gold. Trust me. I... All right, let me see. Four companies in China control Bitcoin. I know that's that's it, it is very speculative. Again, I wouldn't be trading Bitcoin. I wouldn't be trying to uh, profit in the short term moves of Bitcoin. But again, as a buy and hold investment, buy, hold and forget. You know, I think in 10, 15, 20 years from now, I think a lot of these investments are going to be much higher than they are just because of the inevitable uh, printing of money and that and that devaluation of, of paper currencies. All right. So, all right, folks, I'm just going to give you my email once again. I, I'm, you know, I could be here probably for days answering questions and just email me and we can discuss in greater detail. I'll, I'll, I'll answer Larry's question really quickly. Do I think the recent breakout of gold and silver will, will hold? Let me, let me take a look at that on, uh, I just want to show you the chart. Where is it? Okay. And again, I, I don't deal in short term predictions like that. That's how you, it, you will be proven wrong. No, it doesn't matter if it's me or if it's some, some other economist or someone, you will be proven wrong if you're making public predictions about short term moves. And, and for me, I'm not interested in, in being involved in that business. For me, there's really no upside for that. I, I have shown charts before. I, I used to write a lot of charts in my columns, but they weren't predictions where I'm saying gold is going to be at 1500 in one year from now. For me, I'm like, I'll, I'll show key levels to, to watch. But I make no guarantee about how it's going to act at those levels. So anyway, uh, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, I've, I've been showing the 1300 resistance level, which is now a support level in gold for a long time. And, and sure enough, yeah, right, right around the time of the Brexit, we, gold popped right above that level, which was a bullish sign. And also you can see it was accompanied by a lot of volume, which is what you want to see. So for now, that's a bullish chart. Uh, overall, I would want to see it break above the next hurdle, which is the resistance at 1400 uh, as the next confirmation. And again, I would want 1300 support to hold. That's, I've been consistent in saying that. And you can see in the longer term, 1400 is a key resistance level as well. So that's, I wouldn't be surprised if gold hits 1400 just because major key psychological levels like that tend to attract prices to them like a magnet. And I think that's probably what's going to happen here. And it's probably going to try to test 1400 and we'll see how it acts from there. If, if it can break above or if it bumps its head and falls back down. Now my one concern, my actually a, a pretty big concern I have about gold and silver right now is that the smart money is quite bearish on it. And you can see right underneath the chart, you can see in green, green line you can see they've been shorting the commercial hedgers of smart money's been shorting throughout this entire rally so they're more short now than they were back in 2012 2013 before the big gold crash so that doesn't really inspire confidence in 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 gold from me right now uh, again i would not bet against gold if it's breaking resistance levels and continues to go up on volume but it's a little concerning the fact that they're building up this big short. And uh, I, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if they try to smack it back down. Yeah, exactly, Ian. So, well, Deb, they're doing a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things in this case, this mostly measures how many short futures contracts they have right now. So anyway, all right, folks, email me and we'll continue this discussion. Uh, hopefully via email and thank you again so much. I'm sure we'll do more of these and uh, definitely look, I hope to see all of you on, on Twitter and Facebook and so on. All right. So thank you so much. You've been a wonderful crowd. Thank you, Rich. Thank you everyone for hosting this and uh, I'm sure I'll see you all again soon. All right. Take care. Have a great night. Bye-bye. All right, again, Jesse, right, thank again. you so much for everything. Um, as always, just great content. I hope everyone learned a ton. Um, if anyone has any questions about what we talked about before, just about our uh, about tape reading or anything of that nature, please don't hesitate to email uh, email me. My name email address is rlepis at aheadofthecharts.com. 
And we're going to be doing a lot more things like this. I mean, Jesse, we're going to have a lot of other speakers come on. You know, one of the, the goals of any type of educational platform is just to be able to, you know, bring other, you know, other really educated, you know, financial uh, people in the financial industry out there for you guys to be able to, you know, to just better your careers as investors, traders, or whatever, you know, route you may take. All right, guys, so everyone have a phenomenal night. Thank you for coming, and we will all talk to you soon.